Good afternoon, and welcome to this program hosted by the CSIS Energy Security and Climate Change Program. My name is Cy McGady. I'm a fellow here at the program, and today we're going to be talking about the implications of this global shift to electricity, spe specifically the geopolitical implications. Um, I've got two wonderful guests here to talk about their recent work. Um, we have Amy Myers Jaffe, who is the, the director of the Ener Energy, Climate Justice, and Sustainability Sustainability Lab at New York University. And I have Chiara Loprette, who is the Associate Professor of Energy Economics at Penn State. Um, they've both recently done some really interesting work on this subject, so we're going to get into that and then sort of zoom out to some broader, broader themes. Uh, before I dive into the questions, I'm just going to sort of set out maybe what I'll characterize as a thesis statement that I think we're all interested in and is sort of the, the motivating, uh, motivating thesis of this conversation and of much of the work we're working on. So the idea is that the energy transition, broadly speaking, we're all familiar, this is a major topic in conversations, is driving increased reliance on renewable energy. Renewable energy, in turn, uh, basically drives increased reliance on transmission. We need bigger grids to handle all this new reliable energy. So we've got bigger grids, more electricity load. And so the energy transition is by extension driving this sort of, it's creating this push to integrate our grids globally. And um, this cross-border integration of grids opens up a whole new range, a new paradigm for energy security analysis and, and uh, risk assessment. And that's sort of the, the theme that we really want to bring to the surface with some detailed, detailed work mm -hmm. and then also some sort of broader global considerations. Um, I'll just mention, just because I think this is like, this sort of drives home the point that the International Energy Agency recently re released a big report on the grid, um, the global state of the kind of electric grid and some of the requirements gonna be needed looking into the future. And essentially across a range of different scenarios, we're gonna have to double the size of the global electricity grid in the next 20 years. So this grid that's been built up over 100 years, more or less, depending on where you're at, uh, is going to have to double in less than 20 years. And so that's going to be a huge assessment, a huge challenge for risk assessment, investment decisions that policymakers really need to get their, get their hands around. Um, so to start, Chiara, um, energy security has typically meant oil or maybe gas, fuels. What what is electricity, well, you know, how do we think about electricity when it comes to energy security? What are, the, what are the differences when it comes to electricity? So first of all, I'll start by saying that different types of energy have different characteristics that um, kind of affect the way in which a country can use them um, as, as foreign policy weapons. Um, unlike primary energy sources like oil and natural gas, Electricity cannot be directed along a specific route because laws of physics dictate that power flows along the path of least resistance. And because power flows in kind of both directions on a transmission line, uh, unlike unidirectional oil and, and gas, some analysts have suggested that electricity trade tends to involve more symmetric interstate uh, import-export relationships, leaving little room for geo geopolitical pressure. Hmm. However, um, this logic cannot really exclude the possibility that power asymmetry could exist in, in power grids. And, and in fact, based on what you just said, uh, asymmetry could proliferate going forward if more and more nations link their, their grids. Um, for example, because large amounts of electricity cannot be stored economically yet, uh, demand and supply of electricity need to be balanced uh, at all times and locations on, on a synchronous grid. And any imbalance in the amount of generation that is available to meet demand changes the grid frequency, 
which you can think of as the heartbeat of, of the electric grid in a, in a way. So if the frequency is too high or, or too low, uh, many generators will automatically disconnect from, from, from the grid. And there is a potential for cascading outages that may lead to, to blackout. So why am I mentioning all of this? Why is this relevant for, for geopolitics? Well, there are several examples of synchronous areas uh, that connect multiple national grids under the same system frequency. An example is the, the synchronous grid of continental Europe that we're going to talk about uh, later on. It's the largest of its kind globally. It connects uh, about 500 million customers um, in uh, 27 countries. And, and it operates as a unified system at a frequency of, of 50, 50 hertz. Now, all countries in the same synchronous area have an interest, of course, in maintaining grid stability. But importantly, the country that controls the grid frequency may be able to wield power over other countries that are part of the same grid. And this is true even if there is very limited electricity trade between the two countries in question. So this is a very important difference relative to oil and gas uh, and, and the way in which strategic behavior may, may lead to geopolitical pressure there. An interesting case study is given by the Baltic states. And again, we're going to talk about that a little more. Um, the Baltics are the only EU and NATO members uh, whose power grids operate synchronously with the IPS UPS which is uh, pretty much the electric power network that includes a lot of former Soviet countries and is still centrally managed by, by Moscow. Um, this basically means, again, that the Baltics still rely, depend on Russia to maintain the grid frequency. And this raises energy security concerns that are uh, motivating the desynchronization from, from the IPS, UPS, and, and synchronization with the continental grid of so Europe. <laughs> it, it's, it's interesting because oil and gas flows sort of as, as fuels, as discrete shipments, as uh, volumes. Uh, the energy security of electricity kind of flows along fixed infrastructure with, uh, um, that has decades of life. And, and so right. the, this historical linkage between the Baltics and and Russia comes from historical investments historical, decades yeah. in the past. Mm -hmm. And so and, the, right. and we're sort of living with the consequences of that, of those investments many, many, many years down the road. Um, so let's dive into the details of your, your work. I know your work is on on this Baltic issue. Um, so you mentioned desynchronization. What is that? What's going on there? And how are you studying the potential implications here? Amy, Kara, however. Well, let me start. So uh, the first step is, you know, Europe and NATO and uh, uh, the United States, I think, was involved, had to decide how comfortable are we now. Is, uh, this is even prior to um, the invasion, you know, uh, of, of 2021, 2022. So how comfortable are we to have three members of um, the NATO alliance? having their electricity connected to Russia as the sort of, you know, on the control switch. <laughs> and, and so Europe has been sort of hastening the process of connecting those countries um, to its own grid. Uh, but it's a process, and as you mentioned, it takes specific infrastructure, and that infrastructure takes time to plan and build. Um, and so what you have is you have a contractual relationship between Moscow and each individual Baltic state to be part of that, their, you know, the, the Russian grid with Belarus. And they have to give, the Baltic countries have to give six months notice if they're going to withdraw from the system. And so the question is, you know, how are the Russians going to respond? Because it's already become clear that the Europeans are building undersea cables and we're creating new connections and you know Lithuania is putting in battery storage and we're taking all these preparations to get to the point where they can disconnect from the Russian grid and the Russians will have no more technical leverage over frequency and voltage. Um, but because there's a gap between the decision to do that and the timeline to implement it, 
that raises a geopolitical risk. And uh, Kiara, how, how are you guys? I guess how do you how do you assess this risk? What you know? What is the the model that you guys are yeah. kind of asking, <clears throat> digging into this question with? So I, I'd like to <clears throat> to start first of all by acknowledging our other other co-authors who are Son Ying Feng, uh, political economist, and and Ted Lok Tenzelidis, who's a who's an economist. Um, sorry, I think I said a political economist. I should say a political scientist, and and Ted is an economist both at, at Rice University. Um, so the the approach we are taking in in this working paper is essentially a, a game theoretical model. Uh, we're using game theory to uh, to kind of examine and stu study whether Russia um, can credibly use electricity as a, as a geopolitical weapon in in the Baltic region. And and without going uh, too much into the details of the model, this is a sequential uh, sequential move. A non-cooperative game between uh, three actors: uh, Russia, uh, the Baltics, that are modeled as a like a unitary actor in in the game, um, and and the transatlantic alliance of of the EU um, and and the U.S. And and I think a nice feature of the model is that it has both economic and includes both economic and geopolitical payoffs, which is something that most uh, most model. Uh, don't don't consider uh, yeah um, yeah you now so this question of the um of the, of the various actors of course you've got the baltic states in your case modeled as one but obviously they have their various interests different situations you've got russia and then you've got the eu and the u.s on the other side and so i'm i'm curious what do you what are you seeing in terms of setting the context for this game in terms of some of these institutions getting roped into this i mean to my mind we've got in two in two years two examples of undersea energy infrastructure being disrupted in the Baltic Sea um, in Northern Europe. Okay, that's gas infrastructure, but there's, there's electricity lines running under the sea as well. Um, the precedent has been set. What is, what is the role of NATO? What is the role of like defense and national security institutions, planning, uh, policymakers in, in this? So, so we've seen some concrete actions just taken in recent months. Uh, last June, NATO had to set up a special unit um, that was a you know sort of a seafaring force with drones and other kinds of supplementary uh, assets to start to patrol all these undersea cables and um, and, and infrastructure. Uh, but more recently, we had this accidental event um, <laughs> where a Hong Kong registered ship. At the same moment, there was a Russian vessel uh, within the same area accidentally having its anchor break off from the ship and damage a natural gas pipeline between Estonia and Finland and some cables, not electric cables, luckily. But it raised this issue of um, how vulnerable uh, all these different undersea infrastructure is. And of course, this whole plan to move the Baltics away from Russia so that Russia couldn't, through a accidental surge in um, voltage and frequency, you know, get the power outage to extend all the way into continental Europe through all these different connections. Um, that, that this little accident, you know, kind of showed sort of the consequence and the difficulty of patrolling all this infrastructure, you know, all the time um, and, and highlighted just the challenges because the project for desynchronization involves several uh, undersea cables between the Scandinavian countries and, um, and the Baltics. And indeed, at the time that the original accident happened with this Chinese anchor, um, the president of Latvia made a statement that maybe the Baltics would have to work with NATO to close shipping wow. to certain routes, which of course would be a you know, very internationally controversial. So it's really a pretty challenging situation. And I, we feel as academics, you know, I can't speak to what people do behind closed doors at the Pentagon or in NATO headquarters <laughs> yeah. or, or in the Baltics themselves, but we felt as academics, uh, no one in the U.S. system uh, that writes about the geopolitics, everybody's still talking about the sea lanes for oil. People are talking about the Al-Bab Strait now because of the Houthi Yemen's, you know, conflict. 
um, and, uh, and, and support from Iran. And of course, everybody is concerned about Malacca Strait because of the disputes over the South China Sea. And the United States, I think, has credible military response in the sea lanes when it comes to the disruption of commerce and, of course, you know, oil and gas shipping. You know, we, we've, we've shown that we're going to credibly react. We just reacted last week um, to a drone, uh, you know, down by, uh, down by Yemen. So I think everybody understands that, you know, if you try to disrupt the sea lanes for oil and gas, the United States military will do X. <clears throat> but do people understand what the United States will or won't do when it comes to some hybrid or weird or gray area attack that's either cyber or an accident with a cable or you know some of these other electricity issues, uh, which is you know kind of hard to pin down. And if you put that in the context of the you know again the last couple of days reporting about um, an Iranian-backed group or hackers or however you want to describe them being found putting a message on you know, water infrastructure in the United States, I think we have to ask ourselves the important question, which we, which we highlight in the paper, which is, has the United States and or, or both NATO actually imposed a credible deterrent in the area of electricity? Yeah. Because it's not clear. I mean, we, I know there's been a lot of effort on cyber security and cyber offensive, and, and people have studied that. But the broader question for the whole electricity grid and the system, I don't think that's, I mean, no one's written, let's put it this way, no one's written a paper on it until now. And we think it's a very understudied uh, topic. So I agree. Uh, this, these is like, yeah, I guess this is a, a sort of a, a new, a new concern, an emergent concern. And, and the, the worrying thing is that whatever the con conditions are today, we would expect this problem to get worse over time because of sort of background <coughs> trends, sort of creating the, this push towards more transmission. Um, before we get into like the global issue, Sorry. what did the game theory you know assessment find? You know what you know what are the it does <coughs> Russia have a credible credible sort of reason to engage in this? Is in it with with a grid that is connected? Can you engage in sort of credible sort of acts of aggression? So I think one of the things we find is that Russia, <coughs> sorry, when you analyze Russia's incentives, they don't have a strong incentive to be cooperative. Mm. And that's because <coughs> given the situation, they're not likely to gain financially because no matter what they do, chances are the Baltics are going to disconnect. Mm -hmm. So then that leads you to the geopolitical assessment, which is that Russia doesn't want to appear weak or, um, or ineffective. And so that means that what would their incentive be to be cooperative and having people just leave their grid? Um, so that, I think, adds a, a very high level of risk to the situation, which needs to be managed through the US and NATO providing a credible deterrent and the question is, are we in that state of affairs or not? Hmm. I think if I might just add one, one point to, to kind of reconnect to the yeah. grid frequency point that we made at the beginning. Um, so we said that, that Russia still controls effectively the grid frequency of the Baltics. And Emmy mentioned that uh, there is this period of six months in which uh, they'll have to uh, kind of give notification that they want to leave the, the IPS, UPS. The Russian but, grid. The Russian grid. There's but, a window but again, there. There's a window there, right? Yeah. So, so what, what is the concern? Uh, the concern is that uh, Russia might take actions that, that destabilize frequency before the Baltics are, are ready to exit, before they're, they're fully uh, prepared, prepared to do so. And I mean, there's a, a number of, of ways in which this might happen, but what we write about in the paper is the possibility that Russia might disconnect some of the transmission lines between the Baltics and, and the rest of the IPS, UPS. Now, to, to be clear, this would have an adverse effect on on both uh, on frequency of course in both regions right the baltics as well as as the rest of the grid but 
Russia might be able to recover from, from this more easily if they knew that this was going to happen in, in advance. But yeah, they, they can have the backup plants mm -hmm. ready. They can have they the assets. They do, because they, they hold the reserves, yeah. right, that, that are much essentially the, the ones that, that are needed to stabilize the, the frequency. On the other hand, the Baltics, which rely on, on the Russian system for, for the reserves, they, they may not have simply sufficient reserves or, or inertia to deal with, with an emergency situation like this. And the last thing I want to mention is that there was um, um, a kind of a big outage in, in Latvia in, uh, I think, in June of, of 2020. And, and this was reported in an article in The Economist, and it kind of, I think, started concentrated, concentrating uh, minds. Um, of course, nothing indicates that Russia was behind the, the incident, but what was observed was that on that occasion, Russia appeared disinclined to to step in to prevent to to kind of prevent more cascading blackouts and and what what happened then is that there was kind of an emergency inflow from from Poland that that eventually saved the day but but Russia was not again taking um, actions uh, or at least substantial actions to 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 again to step in and prevent cascading outages um, so that, this is the concern, and that's one of the one of the issues that we raise in, in the paper. Yeah, and so you've got transmission lines, cross borders, and it's not only that you're moving, you know, electric electricity, electric power, but you're also you're sort of creating a power dynamic. Pardon the pun, but mm -hmm. you're you're kind of uh, allowing another system, another set of power plants, another set of actors to be involved in sort of the maintenance of reliability. Um, across across national borders, and that just structurally opens up risks, which I think is. And and I think we need to point out that it's not just you know the way we think of oil. Like for a minute, you're not going to have supply, or for a day, or a week, or however long. Oh, there's long gas stuff. lines at the gas station. Right. Because in this case, depending on how the risk manifests itself, you can permanently destroy equipment. Right. That comes from this disruption and the stability of of the electricity. You can blow flow. up a substation. It takes years to replace. Correct. So, so the consequences of being, you know, what does it mean to be prepared? Um, you know, we, our, our Congress, the U.S. Congress, has looked at this a little bit back when they were doing the infrastructure and the IRA bills. Mm -hmm. They talked about because the United States is a major manufacturer of transformers, which are in a sort of a, a global shortage right now. Uh, you know, partly because of climate change, because you have these extreme events, and then people have to replace their transformers in different localities. So. Uh, so we wanted to have something in the bill that would, you know, increase manufacturing and transformers in the United States, and it didn't make it into the bill. And so it's still sort of out there as a concern, which is, you know, what do we need to be doing to make sure, because, you know, Ukraine is needing a lot of transformers because they're at war and the Russians keep, not only did the Russians attack the Ukraine electricity system, they actually blew up the factory in the Ukraine that made transformers. Yeah. Right. So there was really a, a, a electricity war element, which I think people are more familiar with uh, in this latest conflict with Ukraine. Um, and that then you get into this whole question of how much aid can you give and how much equipment and material can you give to Ukraine if you have to worry about the Baltics and beyond? And, and is the idea that the Baltics are the Baltics and therefore they're part of NATO, is that good enough? You know, in this area, it's not well tested about, you know, obviously troop movements into a NATO country, we kind of know, well, we hope we know, uh, you know, how that would play out. But, you know, what if it was just an electricity attack? Do we know exactly what the, how that would be taken? Especially since, because you mentioned, like, it can be so accidental or like, oh, we don't have any power plants available to help balance the grid right now. Sorry. Uh, and it's like sort of plausible that there's a lot of plausible a lot, plausible. a lot of plausible deniability yeah, which, you know which that which, gray zone that's which which you know we kind of saw a little bit of natural gas in the last two years mm -hmm. um and you know the united states you know played a substantial role not only diplomatically in organizing uh you know a coalition of 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 uh, uh nato and 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 helping ukraine but but also the United States played a great role because we have our own LNG. The Biden administration flew around the world and asked people to think more flexibly about their contracts. If they mm -hmm. didn't need LNG in a particular location, would they, you know, 
be willing to have that LNG shifted to Europe. So there was a lot of diplomacy uh, to make sure that there was available natural gas. But like, what's the diplomacy for electricity? Are we going to send solar panels with battery storage and mm-hmm. DER systems for vital services like hospitals? Um, if something were to go wrong in Europe, like what's the plan? Yeah. Um, because it's not transparent what the plan is. And some of, you know, what the Baltics themselves have done have been quite shrewd. You know, Lithuania put in a giant battery farm in four locations uh, to help with grid stability. Um, And so, uh, you know, now Estonia is talking about doing the same thing, but, you know, it's hard to do things quickly. So so this whole question um, about how does the United States play a role, because, you know, we, we know how to play a role in the sea lanes, but what's our role in electricity? I think we have not, we don't have an electricity policy per se. And then, you know, part of that policy is being able to defend our own grid from cyber attack and, and have people feel that we're really confident in our ability to do that. And I'm not sure we're there. So um, this fragility of, or I guess this risk that gets in, is invited in when you create electricity lines that cross borders. We're talking about the Baltics, we're talking about Europe. Um, globally, this is a global, you know, I, I'm, I've made the thesis at the top, I've made the claim that this is a global sort of strategic question. Where else, um, where else, where else is this an emerging issue? Is it a current issue, an emerging issue? Where else should we be looking in terms of watching this phenomenon play out? Well, I think we have to, you know, the places where countries have talked about building these wider grids are ASEAN is one location where it's been discussed. This is Southeast Asia. Right. Mm -hmm. So Southeast Asia or, you know, on the Indian Mm -hmm. subcontinent, there have been some uh, different uh, uh, places that have talked about connections. Um, In the European context, you have the southern context, which is, you know, should the Middle East and North Africa and Europe, you know, sort of grid up together to really enhance the potential to go to more decarbonized energy. Um, And then there are some connected grids um, in Latin America, which right now seem like that's like a safe and happy place to have, you know, electricity traded. But then when you look at what's happening uh, with, you know, old disputes between Venezuela and Guyana, like maybe it's not so, so settled everywhere as we might think. Kira, can you, flesh out for us like why what is it about the energy transition what what is it about the what is the economic case what is what is propelling nations to build lines across borders right like we know it's very clear that this invites risk you know it's difficult to do politically to build infrastructure across jurisdictions but what why is there such a sort of enormous background pressure to like expand the system and to mm-hmm. and to build these sorts of infrastructure if it is such a risk so there are certainly um, a number of advantages of interconnecting grids, and the the two primary ones would be grid stability, and and also enhancing the flexibility of the entire system and maintaining uh, supply and and demand um, fluctu managing. I would say demand and supply fluctuations, um, in a context in which. Of course, renewable energy integration is, is, is on the rise. Interconnected grids enable the integration of renewable energy sources um, like wind and solar because they allow regions with excess um, kind of clean energy to transfer it to areas in which there could be higher demand or lower generation capacity. And, and a good example of this is the, the interconnector between Germany and, and Norway, which is called the, the North Sea Link, uh, which has facilitated now the, the utilization of surplus renewable energy between the two countries, because Norway has a lot of hydropower, whereas Germany has a lot of, a lot of wind energy. And this has been an effective way to balance uh, supply and demand. From an economic perspective, um, having access to varied generation sources, of course, can lower operating uh, costs of of the grid. And um, we were looking at a a recent report, recent estimate for for Europe, um, according to the uh, EU Agency for the Cooperation of Energy Regulators, 
cross-border um, trade of electricity is estimated to have delivered about 34 billion euros of welfare benefits in, uh, in 2021 uh, compared to the situation to, to what it would be if national markets were, uh, were isolated. So in a nutshell, there are a number of, of benefits, but of course, like you mentioned, interconnected grids do not just come with, with shared benefits, they, they also pose uh, some, some risk. And I guess what one example is the fact that if there is a, an issue of failure in, in one part of the grid, that could, uh, that could cause a change in frequency once again that can ripple throughout the, the entire network. Yeah, it need not be malfeasance, like no, aggressive no, no, actors, no, no. you know, no, it just can be, and, yeah. but. And I think the point is, it's possible to have backup systems and contingency planning so that if something goes wrong, um, you know, every, all the actors know what they're going to do and you have backup facilities and backup infrastructure. Um, and, and, you know, we saw that um, during the cutoff of Russian natural gas where, um, you know, the role of, French nuclear power, or um, and even with different, you know, climate events that that uh, countries have traded in a way that, like Kiara is saying, to balance from one location to another. So it can be very enabling if you know what you're going to do. Um, so we're really just asking the question: Do you know what you would do? You know, <laughs> have you built that into your planning? You know, the same way we have the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and we formed the International Energy Agency. You know. Do we have the same kind or level of contingency planning? And I, I think, you know, some of the questions in, in Europe to that is yes. Uh, some of that's being taking place. Uh, and then the question is, well, if when we go beyond that, um, you know, that context, you know, how, how much needs to be done? And then if the United States sees itself as sort of this player in defending energy security for all its alliances and globally, um, you know, what should it be doing uh, when these risks move to electricity and away from, um, or, 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 you know, either away from oil and gas, or we're just going to have all three? Yeah, because like the U.S., uh, you know, relative to Europe, let's say, uh, obviously the U.S. is a massive electric grid. It's all interconnected, the eastern interconnect and the western interconnect on our, either side of the Rockies. It actually does have some cross-border connections with Canada to the north, for example, mm -hmm. Um, fairly small, and also Canada's, we, we feel like the, the politics of our relationship with Canada are fairly stable geopolitically, so maybe maybe not a source of risk, but I, I guess I'm, you know, this seems to be a problem for Europe, you know, a problem for, let's say, Southeast Asia, East, uh, North Africa, and Southern Europe, right, uh, um, the Middle East, well, there's like, like those, yeah. you know, so from a, from a U.S. perspective, it's, it's not our power markets that are necessarily at risk, it's 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 us going to be we're going to be drawn into managing other other risks and so I'm curious like how should we how sh what do we need to build we don't need to build more power lines in our country to help other people what we need to do is well here's here's the big point I mean you you raise really the the crux of the issue so let me take the case of the Philippines so China has announced um, that it aspires to organize a global grid. Mm -hmm. And they've, you know, they, they've created entities and they've, they've done some very good work going into places that don't have access to electricity and building renewable energy and building transmission where, you know, there wasn't any funding for transmission through their Belt and Road Initiative. So they've, you know, been very proactive and, you know, a lot of times in a, in a positive outcome for uh, the receiving country. Yeah, just on a basic energy access level. Correct. But... But, 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 and you know, there's always a little bit of a but, right? It, you know, in the Philippines, the Chinese went in and did some of that, you know, positively brought, you know, new resources to parts of the Philippines that didn't have full energy access. But they also bought a 40% stake in the National Transmission Company. Um, and then they installed all their equipment um, throughout the entire Philippines grid. And now, uh, there's all this debate in the Philippines. Was this a mistake? Could the Chinese remotely turn off their grid from Beijing or not? There seems to be some factual debate about the conditions, about whether they can or they can't. Uh, there's a lot of Hawaii equipment that was installed into this grid. And of course, this is a grid where the United States military 
still has operating rights and bases in the Philippines. And so imagine a scenario where there's a conflict between the Philippines and China over sea lanes uh, and access to sea lanes, which we've seen, you know, sort of flaring up in recent months. Yeah, it's not unimaginable. It's not unimaginable. Let, let's hope it never comes to that. But, but in that scenario, you know, what is the role of the United States? Because we, we would like to use uh, those bases if there's some kind of a conflict and we'd like to have a, you know, now Japan has signed a, a treaty alliance with uh, Philippines in terms of joint strategic defense. And, you know, how do we, how do we navigate the electricity piece of that? Mm -hmm. Is there, in Southeast Asia, is there a move to engage in cross cross border electricity trade? I mean, especially, I guess I would say undersea. I, you know, I, I, I suppose people are aware of the security risk and maybe that has inhibited some of the interconnection that would accelerate, let's say, the energy transition. Mm -hmm. um, how would you characterize the state of sort of of, of cross-border electricity trade in that region? I think, so first of all, going back to the benefits, um, Southeast, Southeast Asia is an area where there could be substantial benefits from, from trading electricity uh, between countries because <clears throat> there is a very diverse pool of primary energy resources and, and, and differences in, in the seasonal pattern of, of supply and, and demand. Um, so just to, just to give you an example, Nepal has a huge hydropower potential, um, and, but by the way, is still a net importer of electricity, mostly from, from India. And, 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 and the, the growth of hydropower in, in the country could, could be really beneficial because Nepal experiences some significant declines in, uh, in hydropower generation in the winter. So would, would really benefit from, from improved access to, to other um, electricity generation from, from the neighboring states. Um, so I think there have been attempts to uh, to kind of have uh, cross-border electricity trade, but but in fact most of the um, most of the trading arrangements have been bilateral so far, with India playing a very big role and 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 establishing some bilateral trading arrangements with Nepal as one, but also other countries like Bhutan and and, and Bangladesh. And, and I think the case, again, the case of Nepal is, is, is really interesting because it's a, it's a case in which geopolitics seems to be hampering progress in cross-border electric, cross electricity trade, not just because of geopolitical developments that are involving India and Nepal, but also other countries like China and, and, and the United States. And, and I'll give you I'll give you a little more detail on on that. So, in 2019, an agreement between India and and Nepal was reached to build a new cross border transmission line between India and Nepal, which would be followed by the synchronization of the two regional grids. This process has been hampered by a lot of geopolitical tensions, not just, again, because of uh, issues that are involving Nepal and India, and That's specifically- a, Yeah, in, power yeah. imbalance akin to the Baltics and Russia, let's say. Exactly. It's not worse. But so there are some, some geopolitical tensions related to border tensions between the two countries, uh, specifically with respect to the Kalapani region, which is a which is kind of an area that is claimed by both India and, and Nepal. But like I said, also China and the US are coming in. Why, you might you might ask. Well, so the the US is partly financing the project of this cross border transmission line through an agreement with the Nepal government, which is called the Nepal Compact. As in, in 2022, which is kind of when I last read about this, the compact had yet to be approved by the Nepalese parliament because many see it as part of the US Indo-Pacific uh, policy to counter China's BRI. 
And so if kind of approving the compact would put Nepal in a very precarious situation or position because Nepal is also involved in planning a separate uh, cross-border transmission line with China in parallel with the negotiations with, with India. So this is an example. Just again, a microcosm. A, a microcosm, but an example in which geopolitical tensions um, between not just the countries uh, that are directly involved, but uh, other global powers can, can, can really affect and, and hinder a process that would have a lot of benefits otherwise, would bring a lot of benefits yeah. otherwise both on the economic side, but also on the, on the climate side, and on right? The climate like, you know, side, we're increasingly yeah. aware of just like the scale of the challenge in terms of you can build the, all the renewable energy you want unless you have this vast expansion of the grid right. within country, intra country, and then across border as well, especially in those areas where there's lots of, lots of countries. Um, we're not going to, we're not going to reach any of the climate goals. It's just like off the table. And so, uh, this is, I, you know, sometimes I think, um, we think the challenge is mostly like resistance from like the fossil fuel lobby or the coal lobby. And it's like, well, actually, no, there's this whole other element that's involved, which is like the geopolitics of making significant decisions about the future of your energy system that are going to last, you know, in the case of the Nivalis, like, you know, that those decisions are going to determine the shape of their energy system for the next 50 years. Uh, and, and, and you know what? We have a good history, you know, with the Nord Pool. Um, in Northwest Europe of how to create um, shared electricity systems governance. Can, will you explain what, just so, briefly? So, so there's a, there's a long established uh, collaborative for electricity trade in, uh, uh, in, the, in Northwest Europe, uh, mainly the Scandinavian countries called the Nord Pool. And, um, and it is very facilitating, you know, you have geothermal, you have hydro, you have these different resources that were available. Um, Gara mentioned that now there's more expansion of offshore wind, deep offshore wind. Um, and so uh, they set up a, a governance system where instead of having like what we described with the Baltics where the Russians are in charge of managing the whole uh, uh, operation of a grid or, you know, China is managing or is seeking to manage the whole operation of a particular grid. Um, there's like a shared governance structure where the different countries each have a seat in the governance um, um, uh, organization and each individual country's um, system operator works at the sort of mega level system operator um, to keep things moving and to make sure yeah. that everything so um, it's possible. So, it, so, so, so there are these precedents. I mean, we don't have any problem deciding how to trade electricity, you know, with Canada. We, we get long experience doing that. But it's that. probably downstream of the geopolitics. Right. Well, well, the point is the same way we have learned to have certain agreements in, in, in different areas to avoid geopolitical conflict. It's possible to do that in electricity. But again, I think one has to study, you know, what systems have worked. You know, yeah. if ASEAN has talked about having a wider grid and interplay, you know, maybe they need to do a, a case study tour of the Nord Pool and figure out how that governance structure worked and how that would apply in the context of ASEAN, for example. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious about this. You know, there's all these benefits. There's, there's a model for how it works. Um, Kara, can you, you, you mentioned study. Like, we need to study how this is done. Like, uh, it sounds like when we... When we model electricity investments, let's say transmission grid infrastructure, we don't we can't just study you know efficiency of dispatch, cost economic you know economics, efficiency of dispatch you know lowest lowest system cost. We also have to somehow assess the geopolitics and maybe price somehow the the, the cost of managing the geopolitical risk. How, as a you know you're, you're a modeler. You, you do introduce this power system modeling. I don't. How, is this something that we, we do or do we something we need to do? How do we do this? So the short answer is we don't. <laughs> uh, so I'll start with that. And, and just to elaborate on that a little more, um, I think in general, electricity interconnections and, and even more so international um, electricity interconnections have remained very much a topic for 
um, engineers and economists that uh, that that do not consider the the geopolitical layer and 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 in fact I'd go a little further I'd say that in in most cases they tend to dismiss it because they they think it's not important um, so the planning studies like you said uh, planning studies are are done to to try and and plan and maintain a reliable electric system and and they generally do it with uh, with some economic engineering models uh, that make some assumptions um, some of which are not uh, necessarily tenable anymore like for instance a lot of models right now still assume that each generator in the system fails and, and recovers independently from, from all of the other, and they don't consider common mode failures uh, that are due to a common cause, like shortage of fuel or, or other causes. And there's been a lot of work done in some areas, including the one that I just mentioned, by the system operators and other entities that are involved in, in, um, in planning studies that are taking steps to better account for, for some of these deficiencies. And to give you an example there, the European Network of Transmission System Operators for Europe, which is ENSOE, um, is actually uh, doing a lot of work to integrating climate change uh, impacts on temperatures and electricity demand scenarios in, in some of their, their major long-term planning, planning studies. Now, when it comes to geopolitical risks, I would say that, that power system planning uh, substantially ignores uh, geopolitical risk right now. And, and so there's, there's, no, there's no consideration, there's no account for, for how a certain future system scenario, for instance, might create advantages or, or, or weaknesses from, from a geopolitical standpoint. And, and I think this is, a, this is a, a, a serious gap in light of, of the conversation we're having here today, and it, it would be important to incorporate that element along with, yeah, costs and environmental impacts and, and other, other benefits, or climate change, yeah, for that matter, yeah. Yeah, it's not like an LNG contract where we can just like run around the world doing some diplomacy and let's renegotiate this. Let me re redirect this LNG shipment because it's it's a paper contract. No, this is this is infrastructure that's going to yeah. last for, for you know our lifetime, right? It's going to last for a long, long time. And as we've seen in the Baltics, as we've seen in the Philippines, ge the geopolitics can change in ways that you don't forecast. Yeah. <laughs> You're sitting here saying, "Oh, well, that will never be an issue." It's like, well, ten years from now. Who knows? Uh, maybe that's a lesson. Um, so, okay. Back to the U.S. We're talking about we're talking to U.S. policymakers. This sort of modeling that you're suggesting, Kiara, is, is maybe an issue for the Europeans. Um, for this, the, you know, for uh, for the for the, the the planners in Southeast Asian countries who sort of face these geopolitical tensions in terms of their neighbors. Um, maybe maybe Africa as well. I think a lot, a lot of countries as a sort of movement to integrate grids there. But for the U.S. policymakers, we don't we're not so much facing that issue. We're facing the issue of how do we support those decisions? How do we how do we how do we stay involved? Um, I want to talk about the supply chain for transformers and wires. Amy, wh where do we sit with that? You mentioned a shortage. How, yeah. Which... Well, so the so in transformers, the United States is actually fairly well positioned because we're a major manufacturing hub. Um, but again, thinking strategically about that industry, like that's an industry that's off the radar for most Americans. You know, they interact with the transformer when it you know something blows up in their service area, and that's it. And they just you know keep calling their electricity provider <laughs> until they replace it. Uh, but thinking strategically about, you know, what are we manufacturing and making sure we have enough here in the United States to address <clears throat> increased, you know, climatic uh, challenges to our own grids or even, you know, cyber challenges. And what is the role that we need to play? You know, maybe we should be thinking about transformer manufacturing the same way we're thinking about LNG, right? I mean, you know, maybe down the road, being able to send uh, places transformers 
I mean, honestly, when you think about what happened in Europe, you know, sending the transformers to Ukraine probably was as important as making sure that some countries had fuel, mm-hmm. right? So, and, and that could be increasingly true over time. So, you know, how do we think about that? You know, the other thing is, you know, we're talking about building out transmission. Um, there's a whole question about whether we're gonna have or not have shortages in COP. Mm-hmm. So, so thinking through, you know, those supply chain issues and then thinking through what are the fundamental components um, you know, do we make all those components here in the United States? Uh, how do we think about the security of those supply chains? Um, you know, that's yet another, you know, complicated issue. And, and you know, I, I, we were already sort of, you know, today we, there was an announcement that um, cars that have this high or that high percentage of components for batteries right. uh, that do not, that come from states that are considered, you know, uh, 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 I forget what the exact word is. Foreign means. entities of concern. Yeah, entities mm-hmm. of concern or something like that uh, won't qualify for the tax credit. Um, and that's just talking about the tax credit. It's not saying you can't you know, use a battery that comes from some of these places. It's just that you won't get the tax credit. Um, but then that raises the question, if I'm needing to have battery storage as a key component, Lithuania, you know, battery storage installations is a key component to how they're going to deal with this synchronization problem between themselves and the Russian system and switching to the European system. If batteries are a key component to that, solar and batteries, then um, the role of the United States in supplying or Europe in supplying batteries and supplying solar panels also becomes strategic. It all comes back to supply chains. I think that's the, that's the world we're in right now, is it? It all boils down to supply chains. Um, the battery question is interesting. At the beginning, we said the electricity is different because it has to be maintained. The supply and demand has to be maintained perpetually in perfection. Otherwise, you get this cascading blackout and disaster. Does the emergence of battery storage change? And I guess, like, let's say, let's say look ahead into the future, 10, 20 years, the trajectory of maybe pricing for battery storage, some of the technology. Is there a potential for like storage um, whether it's battery storage or like, let's say hydrogen or other technologies, um, other moonshots, we might say, uh, to fundamentally change our thesis about like this geopolitical risk associated with transmission, if, if, batter- if storage becomes uh, cheap, does it, does it change our calculus? Yes. How do we think about this? My first reaction and question, because I, I don't have the answer, but my first question is who controls the storage? Yes. Yeah. Right. And, and, and I'm thinking of, of grid storage, right? Like yeah. Storage that would be connected to the transmission grid. But who, who controls that? Is it the system operator? Is there another entity? And, and how, how do we factor that in? Well, and, and if you want to be democratic <laughs> about it, am I going to have the storage at my house yeah, or in so my apartment separate, building right. or at my city story. level? Yeah. Or is the storage going to be, you know, there's a big giant storage facility at a hub provider like in Europe would be in Germany or it would be in some major place. Um, so the whole way we build out storage and think about storage is actually you know, pretty interesting um, because when you start putting the storage at the household level as they've experimented with in Australia and more people have put storage in Germany um, to go along with their solar panels and other kinds of systems. So we're seeing sort of this move to storage at the more you know, fundamental level um, Pentagon's looking at storage for, you know, bases. Um, you know, then it starts to become, you know, a very different question if we really build out a very diversified storage system. Um, and same thing with how we think about trading in hydrogen, right? Yeah, so I, I'm, this makes me think about, um, like, dispersal in the, in the context of uh, storage, let's say, but also you mentioned solar, it's probably true as well. But also transmission lines. The more transmission lines you have, maybe the the more diverse your your um, options are, the more reliable your grid will be. Um, is that? But that costs that costs more money. Like right. especially in storage, like the, the per unit cost of like small storage sites is way higher than the per unit cost of a of a mass storage site. But you might want that smaller the smaller units because it's more secure from the from the geopolitical standpoint. And so, I guess my question is. Is there a fundamentally a trade-off between like, like 
is, is it just going to cost money to like insure against geopolitical risk? Like, is there a trade off between mm -hmm. the efficient system as the engineer would design it and the 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 secure system as the geopolitical analyst would would develop it? And is this like a, a cost that I guess I would say like I'm concerned we're not accounting for this cost. Yeah, I think I think that goes back to yeah to the planning exercises, planning studies, and and I think you're right. There is probably a cost that we're not that we're not accounting uh, for. That we're and, not and, and you don't yeah. when you go to the gasoline station, you absolutely don't in, embed in your gasoline price the cost <laughs> of the U.S. military operations in the Persian Gulf. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I mean, we have a lot of you know history of not accounting for the geopolitical cost. Um, so it really, you know, is a very interesting question about, you know, how much risk are you willing to tolerate? Um, I think what's different about electricity as opposed to oil is that electricity is just instantaneous. And you really can't, you can't do anything. You can't even access oil without electricity. You can't pump oil out of the ground. You can't pump gasoline out of the station. You can't move gasoline by pipeline. You can't move gasoline from what we call the rack, which is the storage place that your, you know, your gasoline supplier is storing the gasoline and then moving it to the different retail stations. All of that requires electricity, right? So the consequences, you can't use your bank. If you don't have cash, you can't buy food without electricity. Can if your if your grocery your... store doesn't have like H E D B did in down in Houston, put in a you know great grand storage uh, uh, system. Uh, you know you can't have you know fresh refrigeration in a gro in your grocery store. So there's all kinds of things that your grocery store can no longer provide. So electricity is just so ubiquitous. Um, I mean, and in and importantly, increasingly so, right? Like Absolutely. This is, this is a long-term trend toward increasingly right. reliant on... So, so I think like here in the United States, that raises the questions like, do I actually trust my utility if I have the resources? Would I actually put in storage because I don't trust my utility? Um, or then, you know, there's some people with, you know, grand plans that say that, you know, I, I mean, I have a friend in Texas who claims that, you know, when they were having their crisis, his Ford 150 did store electricity in the battery and then ship it back into his yeah. house, right? So, you know, people have talked about, you know, these sort of flexible systems. But I do think from an energy security point of view, um, we're not having the full debate yeah. about what assets we need, how will we deploy them? Is it different for vital infrastructure versus just, you know, my regular routine? Um, you know, uh, systems, uh, uh, residential and so forth. Um, so I, I just think that, like we keep harping on, you know, understudied uh, topic um, from a geopolitical and energy security point of view. <clears throat> well, thank you for that. I think that summarizes our point wonderfully, that the geopolitics of electricity are the future of electricity and the future of energy security, I'd say, arguably. Um, thank you so much to you both for coming. Thank you, everyone thank you. online. And we'll be following up this with more work on the topic to come. Thank you.